Up to this point, we have really ignored any effect the air has on the motion of an object. Of course, the objects we have been discussing typically are not affected enough to worry about, but as we get into larger objects, that effect becomes more important. Whenever an object moves through a fluid, the fluid particles exert a force on the object that opposes the motion. So drag force is similar to friction in that respect. Unlike friction, however, the drag force increases at a rate proportional to the velocity of an object. This can be easily demonstrated while driving. If you roll down your window and set your hand on the mirror, you feel a certain force being exerted by the air. If you drive a bit faster, you will notice that the force increases. Keep increasing your speed and pretty soon you have some trouble keeping your hand upright. Now make your hand into a ball. How does that change how the force feels? The total force exerted by a fluid depends on several things. How big the object is as it moves through the fluid plays a big part. Try to move the flat of your hand through a pool of water. Then turn your hand sideways and slice it that way through the water. Which one is easier? So the area of the object as it faces the fluid is important. The velocity of the object through the fluid makes a difference as well. Make a slow wave through that water, then try it again moving your hand faster. Notice that the velocity component is squared, which indicates that the velocity has more of an effect than the other components on the drag force. The density of the fluid the object is moving through will have an effect. After moving your hand through the water, try the same motion through the air. The water, being more dense, will apply more force to your hand. Lastly, there is a coefficient for the drag force for a specific object. These values are typically determined experimentally in wind tunnels. Table 5.2 in your textbook gives a few examples for various objects. One really interesting effect of the drag force is what is known as terminal velocity. Say for some reason you decide to jump out of an airplane. The force of gravity immediately begins to accelerate your body towards the Earth. At the same time, the air particles in the atmosphere are in your way and apply a drag force as you move through them. At first, this doesn't have much of an effect on your motion. But as you continue to accelerate, the drag force increases. At some point, the drag force becomes equal to the force of gravity and you reach equilibrium. At this point, you are no longer accelerating and you are traveling at a constant speed towards the Earth. What if we have a 75 kilogram skydiver jumping headfirst out of a plane? What is his terminal velocity? So we want to look at our drag force equation and we want to know at what velocity does this drag force equal the force of gravity acting on that person. We are given the mass, and from the table in our text we can see that the drag coefficient for a skydiver going feet first is 0 0.70. Even though our guy jumps out head first, the difference in drag from the top end and the drag from the bottom end should probably be pretty darn close. We're jumping through air, so we use the density of air as 1.21 kilograms per meters cubed. And finally, we can use the average area of a person's head of around 0.18 meters squared. Let's do a bit of rearranging before plugging in our knowns to find a terminal velocity of 98 meters per second. To put this in perspective, this is roughly the length of a football field every second as you fall through the air. So what if we have the same person that jumps out of a plane in a spread eagle position? Really, the only thing that changes here is the area of our jumper. We can estimate that as about 0 0.70 meters squared and use the same knowns and equations as we did before. This terminal velocity turns out to be nearly half of the velocity in our head first jumper. So just a small change in area has a very large effect on the object's terminal velocity.